Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Bill of World Bible School, and we are live and on the air doing a Facebook Live this morning because I'm by myself. And uh, welcome to Friday Morning Conversations. Uh, please, by all means, get your Bible, um, a notebook, um, uh, a cup of coffee. Hey, cup of coffee and uh, or, or tea or or water or whatever you like to drink in the mornings. And it, it is morning here in the USA. Uh, so God bless you and thank you for joining me. Today we're going to talk about a real simple question that it's on the minds of a lot of people, and that is, what about love? So get ready this morning. Okay, now, <clears throat> what about love? Uh, let me just take a moment here and um, uh, see if a few other folks are going to join in here because we want to uh, get as many people on this show as possible uh, because this is a, a, a maybe a simple subject but it's a very important subject and um, so we want everybody to be able to get on here you know there's a lot of uh, seems to be several Friday broadcasts and um, uh, so uh, anyway we're getting ready for you this morning amen <clears throat> okay um, all right, let's get started, and we're going to start with um, a, a scripture in uh, 1 John 4, verse 18. But first of all, let me just ask a question this morning. What about loving God and loving others? I mean, that really is what some people want to know. Uh, what about loving God and loving others? Um, loving God, people say they love God, okay? Uh, people say they love God. People say they love uh, others when they can, okay? <laughs> but the reality is, is that it is easier to love God than it is to love others in the minds of many people. Here's the thing, that loving God will never be as pure or be as good of an experience for you unless you learn how much God really loves you. So to love God or love others, a person would really benefit from gaining an understanding of the Creator's love for them. Now, one thing I want to establish real quickly is that the Creator, God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and in Israel, it said the Lord our God is one Lord. He is one Lord. He is the combination of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and that's a different subject. But here's the thing. God loves His creation. Now, we as Christians have been guilty, literally guilty, of, of thinking that God only loves Christians. But see, that's not true at all, and I'm going to show you that in this lesson today. I'm going to show you why love becomes a, uh, can be kind of a false motivator for some people because of a lack of understanding. And so, does God love people? Yes. God loves all people, past, present, and future. He loves all people. He created all people. Do you understand just because a, a, a male and female get together, a husband and a wife get together and produce a child does not mean that that child didn't come into this world without the aid of the creator. That child in a human fetus would be born dead if it was not for the soul and spirit that come from God that entered into that fetus. And so we have to understand, folks, on this show today, this is not, not planning to be a long show. We'll just go as long as the Holy Spirit uh, leads. But the thing we've got to understand is God loves all people. Why? Because they're his creation. And here's another clincher, okay? Father God loves you so much that he loves unconditionally. You know, think about this. If your child uh, steals candy from a candy store, Will you still love them? Yes, you may discipline them, but you will still love them. Uh, let me ask you this. If your child commits murder and goes to prison and goes to the gas chamber uh, and dies, would you still love them? Of course you would love them. You, you would understand they're getting the punishment uh, per the crime that was committed, but you still love them. So what does that say? That says you love people unconditionally, I love your child unconditionally. Now, unconditionally for me means that whether they do something little, do something bigger, don't mess up at all, you still love them. That's unconditional love. 
So think about the times in your life when you've messed up, whether big or little, doesn't matter, whether you're a teenager, a young adult, or a, 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 a full adult at you know 20, 30 years old, whatever, 40, 50, or whatever. Here's the thing. Does God love you unconditionally? Yes. It doesn't matter what age or what venue of life you messed up in, God loves you. So the truth is that we need to gain an understanding of what the author of the Bible has to say uh, about this subject. So 1 John 4, verse 18, I've read this scripture on different programs in the past, but I want to uh, uh, maybe shed a little bit different light on this uh, uh, verse uh, again. Uh, and then we're going to look at another verse. Uh, we're going to look at three translations of this one verse, and then we're going to go to another passage and look at another couple of verses that are just going to be mind-boggling. Okay, 1 John 4, verse 18. <clears throat> there is no fear in love. Is that right? There's no fear in love when it comes to loving. But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Now, I know there are a lot of people watching uh, that will see this broadcast now or see this broadcast after the fact that really are in love with the King James Version of the Bible. I'm not knocking it. I use it in all my study helps. Uh, my Greek and Hebrew, uh, as I study and teach college and so on, I have to have the Greek and Hebrew. And the way I get that is not just the Internet, but through uh, study helps that are tied to the King James Version of the Bible. Keep in mind, I said version because the King James Version is a version. It's not the Bible, but it's a version of the Bible. It's not the first translation, but it's a version of the first translation. And what people will do, and I'm, I'm just going to throw this out here because it's going to help me in talking to you about this scripture. What people will do is say the King James Version of 1611 is the only true translation. Now, here's the problem I have with that. If the King James Version was such a true and perfect translation, why did they rewrite it uh, about 100 years later? Good question. Now, next question. Wouldn't you think that if, uh, and I've used this analogy before, but I'm going to show you something. This is really important, okay? If you were to set up 20 people in a circle, let's just, and that's, that's a big number, but let's say 20 people were sitting in a circle, and let's say that, the first person told the next person, whispered in their ear a sentence, of, say 20 words in a sentence. Um, I don't know what the limit on the sentence would be, but they whisper this sentence, and then that person whispers to the next person, and then the next person, and, the next, and this, by the time it gets all the way around, I've never seen it fail, that the sentence becomes distorted. Why? Because it's no longer an exact translation. Welcome, brother, from... Uh, uh, sister, uh, welcome folks from uh, uh, other countries, from those in the USA. There's uh, uh, Richard, Richard Prophet, wonderful. Uh, Dr. Richard Rundle, my wife is watching. Uh, Pastor Wayne, uh, Jerry uh, Addy. Uh, there's um, 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 uh, my brother, uh, I'm going to say Noah from uh, Uganda, and others that are watching the show today. Thank you so much for joining me. So, when I whisper to the person sitting next to me, they get the very first, the most fresh version of the translation. They get the, the, the translation, but then when it passes on, it's every version becomes watered down. Now, was the King James of 1611 the first translation, the most pure translation? Absolutely not. Um, that was 1680, but how about 1380? And I, I, I don't have a picture pulled up here, but in my files, I have a picture uh, that I'm going to try to find really, really, really fast because uh, it's pertinent to this study this morning, and I didn't even plan on going this route. Um, but I want to show you something this morning that we we often fight over translations and versions of the Bible as if we think we know what the most pure version is. Well, I want to say that because it has everything to do with what I'm about to share with you this morning. So the first English translation of the Bible that contained both the Old and New Testaments was the um, uh, Wycliffe Bible from 1380, okay? So that's the first thing, the first idea we have to embrace is 
his 1380 was the first full Bible containing both Old and New Testaments in the English language. Now, prior to that, there were other English versions of in just the Hebrew or the Greek, but this is the first time they come together was 1380, which was a quite a long shot prior to uh, the 1611 version. Now, here's my point. Since that time, there have been a lot of translations added to the Bible. One of my favorite that I'm going to use today is actually the uh, uh, Passion Bible. It's a newer version in recent years. And I really think that what they're doing is the more they translate the Bible, it's not only to make it more understandable in terms of an easy read type thing. It's more of a let's get as close to the Greek and Hebrews we possibly can. So I never shoot down new translations that spring up. One of them that I like that I don't use a whole lot, but I really like it. It's, a, it's an Amazon download, a Kindle download. It's called the Mirror Bible. And these folks are doing a great job as they're putting this Bible together. It's not fully done yet. But what, what my point to all of that explanation is, is that when we look at this scripture, it makes us think, because I know this happened in religion over the years, it makes us think that the more we perfect our love, the more perfect our love will be toward God and toward others. That scripture has nothing necessarily to do with your love. Uh, let's show this from the Living Bible. Some folks don't like the Living Bible, like some don't like the NIV or other translations. But let's look at the Living Bible here. Uh, and it says, uh, 1 John 4, verse 18, we need have no fear of someone who loves us perfectly. His perfect love for us eliminates all dread of what he might do to us. If we are afraid, it is for fear of what he might do to us and shows us that we're not fully convinced that he really loves us. So if you were to read that scripture verbatim, okay, exactly as it's written, would you think this is about your love or about God's love? Well, it's about God's love. It becomes very, very clear. Now, let me read this same verse to you from the Passion Translation. Uh, there are, are, are versions there's translations, and you could even find some interpretations of the Bible. Uh, it says, love, love never brings fear, for fear is always related to punishment. But love's perfection drives the fear of punishment far away from our, uh, our hearts. Whoever walks constantly afraid of punishment has not re reached love's perfection. Now, that kind of shows us a human perspective of this picture of God's love. But the reality is, folks, that God loves us perfectly. So if God loves us perfectly, then God also has to love us unconditionally. Okay? They're the same thing in my, in my uh, eye, in the way I see things. So the immediate context shows us that the fear of Corrupt, correction, punishment, or rejection is rooted in what we just read. The, uh, the um, Aramaic uh, can be translated that fear is suspicious. So what happens when someone says, I love you, you either believe them and you embrace that, or you suspiciously question within yourself whether that's true or not. This happens among men and women, men and women who are not maybe the most popular people in their classes or their schools. What happens is that someone says, I love you. And they begin to question, why would a person love me? I've not been popular. I have nothing going for me. I have no education. And they question. But here's the thing, folks. Uh, love is not based on fear. Love and fear are not the same thing. Uh, this is often the reaction people have toward God and even others, wondering, do you really love me? People will ask, how can God love me? Well, you know, uh, the simple of it is, is that he's God, okay? God can love you because he's God, period, all right? Uh, many people have their view or opinion of what love means, but is many times a view clouded by the experience of past or present relationships, okay? So had a relationship, 
Uh, I was married. I've heard this many times as a minister of 46 years. I was married. Uh, this person uh, did this, told me that, lied to me. Uh, I no longer trust them. And then ultimately what they're saying in the heart is I no longer trust anyone of the opposite sex. Well, the truth is, you know, things do go wrong, but it, you can't get away from the truth of that. His perfect love in you. And it's not just that it's in you, but it has to be revealed to you. So I would interpret this this way. His perfect love, God's perfect love revealed to you eliminates all dread of that he would do anything to you. You know what God's going to do to you? He's going to love you. Okay? God's going to love you. All right, John 3, 16 uh, and verse 17. Now, we know this verse. This is, this is the classic verse in all Christianity. Uh, even if we don't have a, a good understanding of it, uh, here Jesus is speaking, and he's speaking predominantly to a Jewish crowd, and he's quoting this, for God so loved the world. As a matter of fact, uh, what I want to do is pull that up while we're uh, talking about it, and let's look at the context uh, of the, the passage here, and we'll pull up, uh, say, BibleGateway.com, uh, and uh, the New King James Version, not because that's what we want to necessarily focus on, but I just simply want to look at the context. So in John 3, Jesus is talking about the new birth, and he's talking to Nicodemus, right? Okay, and of course, we're not going to talk about the meaning of born again, because we have too many times taken born again and made it say something that it was not really talking about. And so you go back and study that. I've got an article by a good friend in, in Africa that wrote a piece on that. Uh, you can find um, um, in my um, uh, Finished Works Believers group. Uh, but, but here the context is Jesus is talking about new birth. He's talking about the birthing of something to a Jewish people and what birthing is a new covenant. So we have a a a, a born again aspect from an old covenant mindset to a new covenant mindset. It's not so much the change in you except for the mindset. And so as we look at this passage here, we're seeing that as Jesus is talking, he is telling people these words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Then he moves on to verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Now, let me take the same verse, and we can look at many translations today, but let's just take the passage translation. It says, for this is how much God loved the world. He gave his one and only unique son as a gift. So now everyone who believes in him will never perish, but experience everlasting life. You might say it's important to believe in him, and you might do that from the aspect of being judgmental toward what we call unbelievers. Unbelievers literally means not to believe in something. You're an unbeliever because you don't believe in a particular thing, a particular uh, idea or concept. But here's the thing. I love how the Passion Translation really does bring it into a, a clearer perspective of the original intent of the, in the language. And it just says that now everyone who believes in him will never perish but experience everlasting life. So that being the case, I want to talk about everlasting life for a moment so that we can understand the love of God from, from everlasting life. Um, now. Here's what I want to say about that. In my, uh, in my hermeneutics class, as I teach uh, at an online university, I tell my students in every class I teach, when we're learning to interpret the Bible and we're learning to interpret it from the, from the original language, here's what we do with the English Bible. Every scripture must be interpreted in the light of the finished work of Jesus, number two, the nature of the Father. Uh, and so if you can't if you can't see a scripture interpreted 
as it stands, and you can see the Father's love, and you can see the finished work of Jesus, then this is what I tell my students. Then there must be another interpretation to what you're reading in the English language. So go back and study and dig it out in the original language. So it's so important. Now, John 3, 16 is the most quoted verse of scripture in the entire Bible. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, you go to, you, you watch ball games, okay? And on ball games, you will see, I'm talking about baseball games, and of course, this could be in many other sports, but you will see people who have this uh, flag, uh, this banner, and it will say John 3.16. They've got hats now and t-shirts that say John 3.16. It's a very popular uh, verse. Uh, I don't know if its popularity is completely based on a legitimate fact and what i mean by that is uh that they're uh, really condemning others saying you know here's my advertisement you can come and know jesus or or just what uh, it is however the reality is that john 3 16 is a very popular verse this tells us god's plan for redeeming mankind and saving mankind from destruction. Now, please understand this, that when we talk about redeeming mankind, you might say, but only the church is redeemed. Well, let me just say this to you, that the church is a, a living organism. It's, it's a, alive and well in the earth today, even though many say the church is in trouble. It's not the church that's in trouble, it's people that are in trouble. But let me just say it this way. Back in the beginning, God created man. We call that man Adam, A-D-A-M. But that's not how it's pronounced in the Hebrew. It is the Hebrew word Adam. And Adam doesn't mean the man, although it means uh, uh, red in color. What it means is mankind. So Adam, when God created Adam and gave him dominion over the earth, uh, over everything in the earth, he was giving it to mankind. All we see is one man when we read about the, the, the story, but it's really the, the beginning of mankind, and it is for mankind. And so God, God gives us this plan for redeeming mankind and saving mankind from destruction. Many people in the world today believe that God is a condemning God, that he is condemning them because of their sin. Well, Here's what I want to say about that, and I really could have added a lot more scripture in here today. The, the problem is, is that Father God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but to show them the world through the sacrifice of Jesus, just how much he loves them and just how they might, and just how they might, if night might be saved from sin. Now, when we talk about being saved from sin, there's two points of view uh, or two aspects we need to look at. One is that uh, that this verse was a pre-cross scripture. I realize that not all verses written before the cross really don't have an impact on what happened at the cross. But what I like to say to you, the second part is, is that at the cross, all sin past, present, and future, all sin was forgiven. And now it comes into the play in the new covenant where Jesus is the, the faithful high priest, a new high priest of a new and better covenant that our sins and transgressions, he remembers no more. Why does Jesus no longer remember sins and transgressions that people commit? Real simple, because he was the sacrifice for sin. I said this on the uh, another show it might have been last night it might have been a different one uh, even and that's second corinthians 5 21 that says he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be may become the righteousness of god in christ powerful scripture wonderful verse of scripture the problem with that verse is is jesus didn't become sin he became the sacrifice for sin you can find that out in the greek you can read that from other translations that make it just a tad bit more clear jesus became the sacrifice for sin now being the sacrifice for sin means that something happened on the cross now, i'm going to give you something that's a, a full a full finished works view although it's not really always the the modern christian view of many but just let me give the whole statement and then I'll, I'll try to weigh it out for you. At the cross, I want you to hear me. I want you to hear me. At the cross, Jesus 
provided salvation. Let me just say it this way. Salvation was provided. You say, well, a lot more than that was provided. Yeah, but but we're talking about one in, one package that encompasses everything, which is salvation. Jesus paid for the salvation, the saving of the whole world. You might say it this way. Jesus saved the whole world. But here's the problem with that idea is that even though what happened at the cross is final and done, now there's another side to that coin, and that is that mankind needs to reach back and receive what Jesus did. So I would say this, that the cross is Jesus reaching his hand out to humanity. Jesus, who was a supernatural God, became human, became man for a time so that he might understand man. He might become both God and man so that man can reach back to him and interact with him. So Yes, salvation was provided for all of mankind, all creation at the cross. The only thing lacking is that creation needs to reach back and re embrace what the creator did for us. So, so saved. Now, of course, real briefly, in this package called salvation, there's, there's healing. You know, when you read uh, that, that all men are saved or, or, or salvation is generally uh, the Greek word sozo or soteria, uh, you call it soteria maybe, but it's soteria uh, and sozo. And when you read those words, what you see is that within the soteria, you see healing, you see protection, you see wholeness, you see long life, you see prosperity, you see all of those things in that one package of um, salvation called, uh, we call it sozo, or we call it uh, uh, so, soteria, but it's sozo or soteria in the Greek language. Not that you need to know how to pronounce the Greek language. You're, if you're not a Bible college uh, teacher, you may not want to know that. Uh, but I like uh, in uh, these words, I like knowing how to say them, pronounce them properly, and to understand what they mean. So in the salvation package you receive, it has every benefit you'll ever need in life. So saved does not mean to be born again, but to be rescued from something. Uh, the cross had two sides, the, the Jesus side and, and the back side. <laughs> uh, you got to come to the front. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Okay, so salvation was rescuing you for something. Save means to be free from something so that you can become something different. Or in other words, you're saved from one thing so that you can enter into the thing you were saved for, okay? It's not always about what you, he did to get something done as much as it is what he did to get you into something, okay? Um, uh, and, and all of this is because of God's love for mankind. Now, am I talking to, am I preaching to the choir this morning? I probably am, right? So I'm telling you that God loves the whole world, and you're hearing that, but the message I want to get to you is not only the why God loves the whole world, but the why of why you should love the whole world. It's not, it's not about that person that walks into the restaurant and is vulgar and loud and obnoxious and, and irritating and that you, whether you're to love that person, that we should love. Amen. It's not the person that has the gay lifestyle or has the uh, the 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 um, uh, vulgar lifestyle or has the the uh, drug lifestyle. It, it's not about that. Or even the church door, because honestly, sometimes church doors can be obnoxious. Uh, but it's it's not about what venue of life you're in, what stage of life you're in. It is about the fact that God loves you. Are you hearing me? God loves you. I mean, there is just no two ways about it. God loves you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, not only does God love you, but God loves everybody else. Oh, yeah. You say, but oh, my goodness, uh, Dr. Bill, it's not possible for God to love everybody. I'm telling you, no matter what I think about it, no matter what you think about it, God loves everybody. Praise the Lord. Okay. Now, uh, the reason. God loved the whole world. For this reason, God loved the whole world, meaning all the world, every person in the world, that he gave his greatest gift so that, uh, the greatest gift that could ever be given, so that you could experience love. God gave the only son he had 
so that everyone would become the recipients of what Jesus provided, even if everyone does not embrace the idea at first. Now, let's be honest. There are people in this world who do not embrace the idea of Christianity or of the love of God or of, of Jesus as Lord. I get that. I understand that. But it doesn't take away the fact that Jesus provided everlasting life or eternal life for everybody in the world, even if they haven't embraced it yet. Okay, I get that. But here's the thing about everlasting life. What do you think everlasting life or eternal life means? It means to live in the eternal way. Okay, so is everybody experiencing everlasting life? No, not really. They're not experiencing it yet, but it doesn't take away the fact that God gave it freely. Uh, John 11, verse 26 and 27, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. That's an interesting verse. Do you believe this? He says. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of the living God who is come into the world. So the Lord is not asking you today how strong of a believer you are, how good of a believer you are, how many wonderful things you have done uh, a, a, as a Christian. God's not asking you that today. God's asking, do you believe that Jesus really is the son of the living God? Okay, so it's very important that we really do understand that. Is Jesus the son of the living God? Oh, yes, I believe. All right, then act on that, okay? And what I mean by act on that is, is follow it through and, and do as he does, he loves. So everlasting life is learning how to abide in what the eternal one has already established or provided. It's not about your view of it. It's not about uh, whether you want it to be for everybody or not. It's not about uh, how you feel about it. It's about the fact that he provided something powerful and special for all of creation. Uh, life is about learning to love and learning to be loved. And I've got somebody trying to call me in the middle of the broadcast. Okay. <clears throat> not that it's a problem, but it gets on my screen and messes up my notes and all of that. All right, so uh, okay, now, life is about learning to love and be loved. In other words, life is about learning that God loves based on his perspective of loving all mankind, and not because of some bad human experience or some bad human interaction. You and I, we've had bad human experiences, right? We've had some bad human interactions, okay? And from those, the human emotions, the human psyche establishes a belief system that it's not good to interact with all people. I'm not against having, uh, knowing that there are people we should interact with and people we maybe shouldn't interact. Uh, it's, it's not about that, but it is learning that God doesn't love based on human experience. And we're supposed to learn to be like him, right? Uh, life is not about uh, 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 having these bad experiences and then equating them to whether God loves you or not. Uh, the revelation of God must be based on God himself. So um, I believe that Jesus came into this world to sacrifice his life for you, to become the sacrifice, because Father God loved the whole world. I, I want to preface this. You know, there's two scriptures I like, and that's uh, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. I always interject whole world. And then when God reconciled the world to himself, when God was in Christ reconciling the world, I always interject whole world. He loves the whole world. So no matter how you or I see or understand this, okay, he will continue loving his creation. Everlasting life is not something you will have to wait to get until you understand all about heaven or even when you die. It doesn't come in. Uh, eternal life began when the eternal one came into this world to give you his life in terms of our human perspective. Now, did eternal life only begin there? No, eternal life began ever since there was life in the Father, okay? 
and that that's another lesson so i probably shouldn't even have went there everlasting life is not something you have to wait for everlasting life began in jesus whether you understand jesus now in this life or in some prior uh scenario first john 4 verse 8 he who does not love does not know god for god is love now let me explain this verse because we've quoted this for so many years and i'm about to close but we've quoted this for so many years verbatim and said if you don't if you don't uh love you don't know god what this means is is if you're not walking in the father's love it's because you don't understand the father's love it doesn't mean you don't have love in you or the ability to love it just means that you don't understand the father's love so this is why i tell people if you're going to gain an understanding of anything in the bible make sure you pursue an understanding of the father's love amen now the starting place for this love that I'm talking about. The starting place for understanding the love of God is to believe that God is love and that God loves you. So here's a good question. What motivates God? Well, what motivates God is to love all mankind is you. What motivates God to love people is you. You're the reason God loves. Are you hearing me today? You're the reason that God loves. Amen. And I'm so glad that he does. Aren't you? So as you open your heart and your mind uh, to God, ask him to reveal to you just how much he really loves you. Just, just ask him that question, you know. Uh, because I, if, if there's one thing we can improve on as Christians, it's we can improve, improve on understanding the Father's love. So God loves you so much that he gave his one and only unique son as a gift. And God wants to show you his favor and his blessing through simply understanding his conditional unconditional love for you his unconditional love for you yes he loves you amen jesus loves you i hope you got this message this morning and i would really like for you to take this message and maybe uh click like uh, uh on the, this post and and then maybe uh, uh not only click like but would you also click uh share and share it uh, maybe to your timeline or to a group, to a page, to some friends that, that really have a problem with God loving unconditionally. Because, you know, here's here's the thing, folks. God doesn't have a problem loving unconditionally. <laughs> maybe you have a problem with the idea, but God doesn't have a problem with loving unconditionally. So the fact that he doesn't have a problem is so important, so important, okay? It's so important. And it's even more important for you and I to grab hold of this concept. Look, even when you get down on yourself because you messed up, God still loves you unconditionally. What that means, if it's big or if it's little or you don't mess up at all, God loves you in all those situations. That makes it unconditional. God bless you. Have a great day. Tell someone about what we're doing with World Bible School, the free webinars, as well as the World Bible School University online that's going to be starting very, very soon. We're getting classes arranged even now and looking for instructors even now. So pray for us. If God moves on you to support this ministry, you can go to www.paypal.me for me, me forward slash Dr. Bill Hanshu and make a donation. And I want to encourage people to help spread the word. We need monthly supporters because we're planning to open a worldwide university. It hasn't happened yet. And we made this transition and got moved to Joppa, but we're, the mission is still the same. So uh, pray for us. Uh, ask the Holy Spirit if you're supposed to support this ministry. God bless you. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye, everyone.